Hello, and welcome to The Last Men. I'm Patrick, and today I'd like to present to you a video on my three-part model of pornography addiction. This is a theory I've been working on to describe the phenomenon of uh, widely prevalent behavioral addiction in men, especially young modern men. So let's jump right into it. Pornography addiction. Is it a disease, a symptom, or a medication? And I'll clarify what I mean by each in the following slides. The warning, of course, I'm not a doctor. You need to think for yourself. So here we go, start of the disease model. Here's an infographic showing, obviously, what a healthy brain scan is supposed to look like comparing a brain of a heroin user and a porn user. So you see uh, similar signs of pathology in both addicts. The disease model. So now we're looking at pornography as a disease in itself. And the main mechanisms through which you could describe the behavioral addiction as a disease in its own right is basically through the fact that it is exposure to a supernormal stimuli. That means you are experiencing something beyond what you would find in the normal range of human experience and therefore your brain is having to adapt to compensate for this exposure to extreme stimulus. Um, this results in some of the commonly known adaptations of um, basically a choked out prefrontal cortex. That's the region towards the front of your brain responsible for making good choices and planning. Um, another part of this is dopamine desensitization and if it gets bad enough, the development of a syndrome called anhedonia, which is basically not being able to feel good in response to any normal stimulus. So as a result of watching so much supernormal stimulus, your brain, your dopamine receptors close off. And once they are closed off, when you're going about your normal day-to-day -day life, you don't get any sort of a dopamine, pleasure, excitement, um, motivational response from things like reading and working and socializing. Because although these might be stimulating in their own right under normal circumstances, uh, compared to the supernormal stimulus, which is up here, uh, they are only down here and you're dopamine receptors have uh, have adapted and raised their threshold to let's say like here and anything under that amount of stimulus you're just not going to get any reaction from and that's where you get the guys complaining about I can't get any enjoyment out of life um, as a result of their addiction. Um, the gray matter in your prefrontal cortex has actually been shown to shrink especially as a result of long pornography viewing sessions. Uh, guys who are addicts tend to get into like watching it for two or three hours straight, clicking through hundreds of different videos. During that long time period, you're doing damage to your brain. You're starving it of uh, a lot of blood flow, actually. And then finally, the MO part of PMO, um, will serve to unbalance your male hormone levels, especially with often repeated occurrence. And the result of that is that your poor, unbalanced hormonal profile will make you feel worse, and that will feed back into itself, driving the disease further. And we'll see that expanded on the next slide. Um, Pornography addiction represents a positive feedback loop where a small disturbance 
watching it once increases in magnitude to a full-blown addiction and severe negative effects to your life. It can actually be a quite completely disabilitating uh, situation. So one viewing makes you more likely to view it again because of dopamine desensitization, because you are strengthening that one reward pathway that you are using any time that you do something that yields a positive reaction. Your brain gets better at doing it and your brain makes it more likely that you do that thing again in the future. That's why if you play chess for the first time and you win, you're going to be more likely to keep playing chess and keep getting better. This is like uh, how people gain skills overall. Um, because the positive emotion that you receive uh, strengthens that particular reward pathway. And another result of the MO portion of a pornography addiction, if you don't know what PMO stands for, just do a Google search. And crazy high elevated dopamine will actually have a negative effect on your brain serotonin as well and will cause increased anxiety due to chronically re-elevating your stress hormone levels as part of the MO process. And I'll get into all of these particular subjects in more detail in future videos. This video is just to provide an overview of the three models. So if you don't know what a positive feedback loop is, it's obviously just something where a small input or a small event uh, causes a reaction that makes the the input greater and greater and greater and greater. So here an example is uh, of, of a stampede, of like a herd of cattle, and so the number of cattle running uh, will increase the overall level of panic. As the overall level of panic increases, that gets more of the cattle spooked and running. So that's how you get a stampede starting. Next, onto the symptom model. So the basis of the symptom model is right here, serotonin. And serotonin, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's a brain hormone commonly associated with feelings of wellness. And common treatments for depression are actually normally selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which basically make it so that the last bit of serotonin you have in your brain, uh, the small bit of serotonin you have, is able to kind of keep bouncing around in your brain instead of being used up and then you just have no uh, serotonin activity going on. So serotonin deficiency actually leads to dopamine hyperactivity because uh, in your body, all of these different neurochemicals and hormones tend to um, have relationships with each other and balance each other out like um, zinc and copper and testosterone and estrogen. And so serotonin and dopamine have a similar balancing relationship in that um, the more serotonin you have, the less dopaminergic activity. If you have a deficiency in serotonin, it's actually been shown that you will have dopamine overactivity. You will have too much dopamine going on, and this will actually increase the risk of and severity of addiction. So we'll see here with these arrows that serotonin goes down, your ability to delay gratification goes down, and your sense of well-being goes down. And dopaminergic activity as a result goes up because serotonin is like the safety check on your dopamine levels. And when there's no serotonin there, dopamine is free to, um, to both increase and be more biologically active. Dopaminergic hyperactivity is associated with impaired decision making and impulsivity. So you'll see here that if you have super low serotonin levels, you might be especially at risk for addiction because when you have dopamine hyperactivity, anything that feels good or anything that is rewarding feels even better and feels even more rewarding. So something like a super normal stimulus 
To a normal person, it might feel great, but to a person who has dopamine hyperactivity, it's going to be like indescribably amazing. Obviously, it's a lot easier to get addicted to something that feels indescribably amazing than it is to something that just feels great, especially if you also have um, a lowered sense of well-being in the first place because when you're walking around all day feeling bad, suddenly you find something that feels like super indescribably amazing, you're obviously going to start to get geared towards um, wanting to repeat that thing that made you feel so good. Why might you have low serotonin? And if you search this up online, they'll give you a lot of um, potential reasons why. But actually, the main reason why, I think, is because of this L-tryptophan to NAD pathway you'll see on the right here. And this might seem super complicated to you if you don't have a background in biology and chemistry. But um, basically, NAD is the active end result of niacin. Niacin, you've heard of it for sure, but you've heard of it as vitamin B3. And what vitamin B3 does uh, in the body mainly is that it's converted into NAD. And NAD is essential in the ATP energy system. What happens here that would cause low serotonin is that L-tryptophan is an essential amino acid. If you're like a gym guy, you'll know that these are amino acids that your body cannot make. L-tryptophan is one of these key essential amino acids which you must take in through food your body cannot endogenously synthesize it. So what happens here is that L-tryptophan can be used to make serotonin. L-tryptophan is can be used to fuel muscle protein synthesis. Uh, L-tryptophan is used for a bunch of things in the body. The problem is that there is, well, it's not a problem. It's a great thing from an evolutionary survival standpoint. But the issue that I'm basing my theory here off of is that in order to get NAD, if you don't have enough of this niacin, your body can kind of as an emergency backup measure produce nicotinic acid from L-tryptophan. And um, this is great, but the problem is, is that uh, this NAD pathway is very inefficient. Uh, typically, it takes 60 milligrams of tryptophan to get one milligram of niacin. And like the average person's diet is only like a gram of tryptophan per day. So getting niacin from tryptophan is not optimal at all because again, 60 milligrams to one milligram of niacin. If you only have a gram of this tryptophan that you're bringing into your body total per day, remember your body can't make any more of it and you're using 60 milligram chunks of it to make a single milligram of niacin, you can see that it'll put a lot of pressure on your body's supply of tryptophan, especially when you have to remember that your body wants tryptophan to make serotonin and to fuel your protein synthesis overall. There's a lot of uses for proteins in the body. Um, and also the problem with using this, this pathway is that in order to convert tryptophan to niacin, your body actually uses quite significant amounts of vitamin B6, vitamin B2, riboflavin, and iron. So it's if you're constantly relying on this pathway, not getting enough dietary niacin, you're going to not only be low on tryptophan, but you're going to be low on B6, B2, and iron, which is going to totally skew a lot of things in your body out of whack because these are also essential nutrients. So the average daily niacin intake from diet is 30 milligrams NE, and this is a term they use in nutritional science. It means niacin equivalence because there are different forms of niacin, the main one being um, niacinamide. And if you look at on like the ingredients boxes to your cereals or your, or your breads, you'll see that they have a certain amount of vitamin B3, but when you actually look at the ingredients, it's not niacin in it, it's niacinamide. And the main reason why they include niacinamide instead of niacin is that if you're having a lot of it in one go, there's a the chance of a flushing and a warming reaction in the body. And people are generally 
um, averse to that, especially if they don't know what it is. So if you're a food manufacturer, you don't want to, you want to just stick with the easiest and the simplest and the least likely ingredient to cause problems, allergic reactions, and so forth. There's a reason why the niacin is what you actually want. That is because when you take niacinamide, it works through the salvage pathway. And if you don't know what that means, basically your body has like a main pathway through which it gets um, certain molecular com compounds normally or preferentially. But your body also has all these kind of backup recycling pathways for a lot of things. When you take niacinamide or any of the anti-aging versions of niacin, NMN, NR, um, you'll find that these are actually, one, not effective at boosting NAD levels. Um, niacin is the most effective, the only really effective way of doing so, but that's not what the guys who want to sell you expensive NMM supplements say. And you'll find that these salvage pathway precursors and metabolites, basically things that go before and things that come after of a certain compound, they are found in basically driving cancer and other disease such as acute kidney injury. So keeping account of your niacin equivalents for the day and thinking you've covered your niacin needs doesn't work at all because actually the more niacin equivalents you take in, your, your body actually has an increased need for niacin itself and actually glutamine too because glutamate is involved and the conversion from niacin to NAD+. So before we move on to the next slide here, I just want to quickly interject and talk a bit more about the niacin flush, which I mentioned. This can be a really severe effect and it can cause people to panic at first. It is a serious reddening, vasodilation, and thermogenic effect to your skin, also commonly accompanied with itching. So this is why it's important to do your own research talk to whoever you need to talk to, and make yourself familiar and confident on using niacin before you start using it. And typically it's recommended in order to minimize the flushing reaction to actually start with an incredibly small dose and work your way up. After about a week, you won't flush from the small dose. You can go up to a bigger dose. Hopefully if you do it this way, you never get an insanely intense flush you just slowly get used to it and build up for myself i take uh, on a very large dose of niacin and typically i do not flush at all if i do it's a little bit of redness around the eyes and kind of a pleasant warming sensation uh, the flush can actually be therapeutic in a sense too so for most people it's nothing to worry about but definitely something to be aware of how much niacin do we need this is a hard thing to answer because if you look at the RDA online, you'll find like um, 13 to 16 milligrams per day. And this is crazy because that number was actually derived from the bare minimum amount you need not to get pellagra. And pellagra is like fatal end-stage niacin deficiency. It's like you're basically so low in niacin that you're going to die. So basing the RDA off of the minimum you need not to immediately die is totally different than trying to discover the amount you need to thrive, the optimal amount. And if you look at studies done on animals, you find that there's a range between 30 to 650 milligrams per kilogram of feed. The average American male who's just shy of 200 pounds, he eats around two kilograms of food per day. That gives us a range between 50 milligrams and 1300 milligrams per day for optimal growth and optimal health. You'll immediately note that there's a big gap between even the low end 50 milligrams and the RDA of around 16 milligrams of niacin equivalents per day. And so how does our body fill in that gap? Obviously we're relying heavily on that tryptophan to NAD pathway in order to bridge that gap. Maybe between 50 milligrams and about a gram would be more than enough 
for your average person, but there are going to be some people who need a, a minimal amount of a vitamin to get by, but there will be other people due to genetic variation that will need a lot more. Just a recap of this tryptophan, why it can drive your addiction, your behavioral addiction, your porn addiction, because tryptophan to 5-HTP to serotonin. And if you're using up all of this tryptophan, you've got no more tryptophan or you have a limited amount of tryptophan left because you've used the whole bunch of it to make extra NAD and NAD is essential. You, you absolutely have to have NAD. It's involved in over 400 different chemical processes within the human body. If you use up so much of that tryptophan to NAD because you don't have enough niacin, your body's trying to compensate for the lack of niacin without that tryptophan you're not going to get any of that serotonin and that's where your serotonin is low and your dopamine is too high you're going to be feeling bad all day long you're going to be looking for something um, to make you feel good you're going to be really susceptible to those to those addictions because your impulse control has gone out the window when nice and deficient how can tryptophan be available for conversion into serotonin the little rabbit doesn't know i don't know either the symptom model. Here is the proposed mechanism. This is an, an infographic I got from a study. This is one that I made just explaining it. That was the pornography as a symptom of niacin deficiency model. And we're going to move on to the third model now, the pornography as medication model. So here we're going to discuss uh, people who use their behavioral addiction as a form of self-medication. And these uh, self-medications like all medications can come with side effects that can actually aggravate the original condition. This model of um, self-medication relates back to the positive feedback loop which I originally introduced under the disease model and that's being that the small disturbance increases in magnitude. Obviously the side effects of using, of self-medicating with pornography is that that reward pathway is strengthened. Also, of course, your dopamine receptor sensitivity is decreased and you have increased stress, increased anxiety, that all those things make you want to escape from the world even more. They make you seek out your self-medication even more. So this is, I feel, an incomplete model because trauma is always present in life but should not disable you as a person. And when you're a severe behavioral addict, or even, of course, as a substance addict, that totally disables you in your life. And um, the idea that, well, you feel bad because you're young and you haven't accomplished anything, and you're low status, and therefore you want to seek out some sort of medication because you don't have a girlfriend and you don't have a high paying job and you're not a high social status man yet. This doesn't really make sense to me because having a low status is normal for young men. Um, it's always been the case and it should be not a reason to seek out a medication but it should actually be fuel, it should be a motivating prompt to action uh, this you get into the idea of the like the hero's journey, which is your fate as a man. You have to go out and conquer the world. It's not a normal reaction when you're prompted with that being low on the totem pole, but you see the whole to totem pole. You should want to climb the totem pole. This pornography as a medication model definitely fits into Nietzsche's description of a narcotic being something that we use to distract ourselves from uh, value formation. Why is pornography effective as a medication? It's because of endorphins. Endorphins are the body's natural painkillers. Endorphins are released by the hypothalamus and pituitary gland in response to pain or stress. This group of peptide hormones both relieves pain and creates a general feeling of well-being. This feeling of well-being created as a result of using your self-medication makes you forget about your low status, your problems. It makes you forget about your problems temporarily while 
aggravating your problems actually. Also the dopamine and adrenaline spike you get from porn makes it an effective medication because we already know that uh, norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors are used to treat depression, ADHD, uh, seasonal affective disorder. So low social status monkeys choose drugs over food in studies and rats in stimulating social environments don't form addictions. So these are two things supporting the pornography as self-medication model. In conclusion, I think all three models should be considered for greatest recovery potential and framed in a utilitarian manner, meaning how can we use this information. Uh, understand that seeing any erotic stimulus enters you into that positive feedback loop. So even something like social media, you're seeing all these girls posting their attractive pictures and stuff will trap you in that positive feedback loop, will make it very likely that it builds and builds and builds until you're a full-blown addict and you don't know why or how you got there. Uh, some alcoholics can never take a sip again and some can drink. So I think when it comes to porn addicts, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, some are going to be able to use social media and look at these pictures of girls and not have any problem. Some just, they're, they're, they're going to fall in, into that downward spiral, that trap every single time. We can, not we, because I'm not qualified to give medical advice, but a theoretical version of myself could supplement niacin and work up to 500 milligrams per day and um, hopefully they can over time restore the niacin, fix their gut, start to absorb all the other vitamins better and get their serotonin levels back up to where they should be, get the dopamine back into normal ranges as well and then maybe they're not going to be so susceptible to the uh, super stimulus in the first place. Maybe they're going to have a greater sense of well-being and uh, the whole situation is going to be a lot easier. Finally, determine your values, obey a sensible life timeline. I think a lot of young guys now because of the influence of society kind of have that flipped backwards. They think it's a priority to mate first meanwhile they haven't mastered their life yet, right? So, um, and when they think that the first thing that they need is a mate, obviously they're going to feel that the uh, porn, the artificial mating is an attractive thing because they think it's something they need in order to be a man, right? And um, really you need to uh, master yourself, master your, your space, and then you can consider actually mating. This imbalance in your values, I think, can really feed into uh, at least the initial uh, susceptibility to an addiction like this. And there we go, the video is done. Please like and subscribe. Like I said at the beginning, I want to make more videos like this and I want to expand on each of these individual models. So um, please comment if you notice any shortcomings in any of my speculations or theories. Uh, if you have any personal experiences which can add to this discussion or if you simply enjoy the content, please, I definitely appreciate comments. And please also ask any questions. I am very interested in this subject and uh, in the subject of optimizing our health and our lives as men overall. So I'm always happy to think and to expand my knowledge too. So please ask questions. I'll definitely respond to all of the comments. Thank you for watching and have a great one.